German Expressionism is an artistic movement which appeared in Germany during the beginnings of the 20th century. It privileged the artist's inner thoughts and feelings rather than the reality which was at the surface of the work that they produced. One of the most noteworthy of the Expressionist films which was created during this period was Robert Wine's The Cabinet of Dr Caligari, a nightmarish vision which seemingly encompasses all of the tropes of the movement in one sitting, including the melodramatic acting styles, the starkly contrasted lighting and the macabre storylines and the sonobulists with their hypnotist masters. Many have frequently fallen into the trap of seeing all Germanic works through the lens of what happened during the years that the country was under Nazi rule. Cultural artefacts that have come before have either predicted the rise of the Third Reich, or those that appear after are created in order to try and come to terms with what occurred in the country between 1933 and 1945. Although this rather narrow view restricts how we look at what is an interesting question of what influences a national identity and why this comes to be formed, there is much to look at in the cabinet of Dr Caligari that points to a German public that after World War I was ripe for the cultivation of fascism. Siegfried Krakur's text, From Caligari to Hitler, looks specifically at this notion in great depth, using the film as one of the clear case studies for his thoughts. Krakur believed that the film was a uniquely suitable medium to reveal the collective subconscious of the population, as it was a mass-produced form of populist art, which first and foremost was created to be consumed within a marketplace and therefore had to reflect the values, and thus concerns and hysteria, of the time and place that it was created. Krakur said of Caligari, Whether intentional or not, Caligari exposes the soul wavering between tyranny and chaos, and facing a desperate situation, any escape from tyranny seems to throw it into an utter state of confusion. Quite logically, the film spreads an all-pervading atmosphere of horror. This can be seen most clearly in the chaotic, carnivalesque production design, with distorted shapes, oblique angles and strange perspectives which disorientate an audience. The final scene of the film isn't as stylized as the rest. The buildings are no longer sloping. Doors, windows and building arches are evenly shaped, and even the chairs at the right of the frame are realistic. This presents us with the notion that the surreal nature of the rest of the film and its excessive style is no more than an aesthetic choice. It's an essential element of the narrative of the film that captures the subjective mind of the protagonist and his mental instability. Throughout, the film has hoodwinked us into believing that the subjective narrative from an unreliable narrator. Francis has become alienated from reality and escapes the truth and the burden of his guilt as he slips into his fantasies. The ending scene has us believing in the altruism of the very man whom Francis considered to be the villain of the piece, and the director of the asylum where Francis is a patient now, having an understanding of his ills, will be able to cure him. According to Krakur, in the original ending of the film, the writers of the piece, Hans Janowitz and Karl Mayer, had written a much more radical ending, which exposes the madness inherent in total authority. However, Wine's version of the piece seemed to glorify authority, as Krakur says, This change undoubtedly resulted not so much from Wine's personal predilections as from his instinctive submission to the necessities of the screen. Films, at least commercial films, are forced to answer to mass desires. It appeared that in Krakur's mind that the change of the narrative was made for economic rather than artistic reasons. However, one might argue that it is in relenting and delivering a populist message such as this we see a public who are comforted by authority, rather than one which is keen to challenge it. However, the film also outlines another key theme explored across other expressionist films. The beginnings of the 20th century brought about many great strides in technology and industry. This in turn changed the face of the modern city and further accelerated the separation between the worker and their labor due to the increasing industrialization of the workplace. This creeping madness of modernity was something which troubled many in society and this was reflected in the cultural output of the time. In the films of the German Expressionists, the urban landscape was both used as oppressive and corrupting, both spiritually and morally to the men and women who lived within them. Eventually, the mere exposure to modernity would seemingly send these characters who were not alert to the madness or have them languish in their gluttony and detachment. Another piece of work which deals directly with the issues of modernity is Fritz Lang's 1927 dystopian epic, Metropolis. It 
It showcases a world where the working class are now no more than slaves, which are fed into a machine which powers the city for the bourgeoisie above them. When our hero Freda ventures into this subterranean world, he swaps places with a worker whom he bears a striking resemblance to, and offers to take the burden of his labour while he ventures above ground to see the decadence Freda usually enjoys. As the narrative progresses, Freda embroils himself in a revolution of the workers, who wish to seize the means of production and take control of what has been built off the back of their exploitation. However, in a similar way to Caligari, Metropolis's ending seems tempered. With the revolution on the doorstep of power, admittedly one they were tricked into, Freda, under the guidance of schoolteacher Maria, reaches between labour and capital as the mediator between the two, with the final title card suggesting that the wider theme of the film, mediator between the head and hands, must be the heart. In this moment, once again, we see a populist message, which was widespread in Germany at the time, of how there needs to be a trust put in those who control the levers of power, rather than trying to snatch them out of their grasp. In direct contrast to the horrors experienced in the urban landscape of German Expressionism, adventure films such as The Holy Mountain showed audiences the natural world as a pure and liberating space, which stood waiting to be conquered by the noble men and women who dared to venture there. However, even these narratives have a rather troubling connotation with the notion of Lebensraum, which was the belief that the Nazis had that the German people were entitled to living space, which was just beyond their borders. In addition to these two prevalent themes within the work of the Expressionists, there was a growing interest in the macabre and the afterlife when World War I ended, and an increasing concern on the damage that the conflict had done both physically and emotionally to the individuals and the collective nations who had fought in it. In Wasteland, The Great War and the Origins of Modern Horror, W. Scott Poole looks at how the horror genre slowly evolved and took shape after World War I. Major films with themes still recognisable to horror fans today, like Je Accuse, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu all appeared within a few years after the end of the war. Almost all were produced, directed and written by veterans who had seen some of the worst of the fighting on the Western Front. These films were their way of dealing with the horrors that they saw and articulating to other ex-soldiers in the audience that they were not alone in the feelings of shame, guilt, fear, disgust and anger that they had inside of them at what the war had done to them. Although not a comparable substitute for the help that many of them would have required, these films acted as a way of exercising many of the feelings that they had bottled up inside of them. In The Cabinet of Dr Caligari, César, the sonambulist, is under the spell of Caligari, who could command him to do anything. There is this notion that we see the idea of the body as automata, a kind of death doll, an empty husk. Although a terrifying notion, it could have been one which offered an odd comfort to those who had served through the war. As Crocker notes, functioning as a mere instrument, Cesar is not so much a guilty murderer as Caligari's innocent victim. According to the pacifist-minded Janowitz, they had created Cesar with the dim design of portraying the common man who under the pressure of compulsory military service is drilled to kill and be killed. Krakow concluded his chapter in From Caligari to Hitler, which is specifically about the film, with this rather ominous paragraph. On a visit to Paris after the release of Caligari, Janowitz was told by a count that the piece was as fascinating and as obtruse as the German soul. He continued on. Now the time has come for the German soul to speak, Monsieur. The French soul spoke more than a century ago in the revolution, and you have been mute. Now we are waiting for what you have to impart to us, to the world. He would not need long to discover. <laughs>